Uh, my name is Mike Holland. I'm one of the investigators in uh, the TAPAS Tackling Air Pollution at School uh, Network. Um, if any of you are new to TAPAS activities, you're quite welcome to join. There is no fee. Um, and uh, details on joining up with us and getting more information on TAPAS will be put in the chat uh, that uh, Kat will uh, has possibly already put into the chat. Um, our speakers uh, this morning are um, Fiona Davis and Susan Micklem from the Glasgow uh, Science Centre. Uh, Fiona is a STEM learning manager. Um, STEM, for those not in the know, is science, technology, uh, engineering and maths. And she has a background in project engineering and the passion for STEM learning. She's an experienced project manager and she's led the learning team at Glasgow Science Centre since 2014. She's responsible for the Science Centre's education officer and leads programmes including Learning Lab and STEM Futures with a commitment to supporting schools and the drive to provide unique learning experiences of the highest quality. Susan uh, has 20 years of science communication and development experience in science centres. Um, it's particularly interesting to me today as I was involved in a, a discussion this morning where we were struggling uh, with concepts of uh, communicating uh, indicators on air quality to people. So it's great that we have a, a communicator talking to us today. She's passionate about engaging learners of all ages and from all walks of life in a wide variety of science subjects through interactive exhibits and hands-on activities. Her current focus is on improving science literacy by supporting primary school teachers to provide engaging science learning in the classroom. They'll be talking today about Learning Lab, our amazing AIR, which is a CEPA and Glasgow Science Centre partnership. Um, I thought this was a really refreshing title, uh, Our Amazing Air, because for about the last 40 years, I've been talking about our polluted air. So it's good to see something that is, sounds a lot more positive uh, about, the, uh, about the world um, around us. Um, if I can ask, I think everybody's muted, but I've, if I can ask you to uh, keep muted um, whilst uh, the presentation uh, goes on. Um, if you have questions, um, we normally ask people to put them into the chat and then we go through them at the end so the speakers can have a, uh, a sort of clean run through of their uh, presentation. Uh, so at the end, I will pull out the questions from the uh, chat for Fiona and Susan. And if anybody has extra qu uh, questions at that time, uh, you will be um, uh, free to ask them. So with no more ado, I'll hand over to Fiona and Susan and uh, to tell us about Learning Lab, our amazing app. Thank you, Mike. Thank you for that introduction. And thank you so much for having us along with you today. Thanks to our friends Colin and Graham at CEPA for inviting us to join you. Um, we're delighted to be here to tell you a little bit about Glasgow Science Centre and a little bit about our collaboration with CEPA and our amazing air. So for those of you who haven't been or aren't familiar with us, this is Glasgow Science Centre from the air. We are a large science centre, the largest in Scotland, and we've been open since 2001. Um, we, this is our visitor attraction, uh, this building, but we are an educational charity and we exist to share science with uh, schools, communities and the general public in this building and across Scotland. Um, so our vision really is, is for a STEM, a science nation where people in this country are equipped with the skills and opportunities and connections to make positive differences in their lives um, using science. We believe that science is really important to help them do that. Um, we have over 20 years experience in designing um, and delivering impactful education programmes and exhibitions. Um, we've got really good relationships with schools and um, local authorities and the families and communities that we work with in the Greater Glasgow area. Uh, we're a trusted organisation and um, people come to us because they uh, believe in what we do and they, they trust that we'll deliver unbiased and um, equitable access to science. Uh, we have quite an innovative and collaborative 
approach to what we do. Um, we believe that we're all scientists, that's what we try and encourage our visitors to, um, to believe that science is for them and that, that we all think like scientists in these different ways. Um, and we believe that you know, science is about, um, is relevant to, to our lives and to, to wider society. So um, just to give you an idea of the sort of size um, of, of the visitor attraction and what we do more widely, we engage with around 350,000 visitors a year in this building um, and 70,000 school pupils visit us um, every year on average. And just it's a coincidence that the 70,000 also is the number that we engage with um, outside. So we have a, an outreach um, arm and we have vans and we travel across the country uh, and engage with schools and communities all over Scotland as well. Um, and Learning Lab is the programme that we're, we're going to talk a little bit about. So we obviously have this really exciting collaboration with CEPA and we're going to talk specifically about our amazing year. But Learning Lab more widely um, is an education programme that we developed when we were closed during lockdown actually. We we were in a sticky situation where we couldn't go and visit anyone anymore and they couldn't come and visit us. But we we still had um, contracts and relationships with schools um, and wanted to be able to support them and to support the teachers uh, to carry on delivering amazing science. So we developed this programme um, to bring science learning into the classroom or into homes when people were, were um, doing uh, home learning. And it's a, an extended programme of learning. It's not just a one day trip to the Science Centre. It's a programme that takes place over six to eight weeks. Um, and pupils are engaging with videos and a science topic. They're taking part in practical lessons. Uh, teachers have got uh, lesson plans to support them with that delivery. Um, a really important part of the programme is that they, the pupils get the chance to meet practising scientists and engineers, someone in the industry that can actually tell them what this job is like, how I got here, uh, what skills do I need to do this, and the young people can see themselves potentially uh, going into something like that. We also engage with families through home learning activities, so it really is um, quite a, a varied and um, multifaceted kind of um, approach to science learning. Um, and we have a range of topics uh, and a range of age ranges that we engage with as well. Uh, the programmes are all linked to the curriculum, so that's really important. That supports teachers to deliver the, the science and technologies curriculum in the classroom. Um, and you can see there just some um, of the topics that we cover through this programme. And although it was developed during lockdown, it's remained our kind of fundamental way to engage with schools and as I say it, it goes beyond that one-off visit, that one-off uh, day and, and brings us into uh, being really impactful and delivering these extended experiences so we're still doing, doing it today and intend to, to keep doing it into the future. Thank you. And I'll pass over to Susan to talk specifically about our amazing year, which is what we're all here to hear about today. Yeah, so we've got about nine different learning labs and one of them is our amazing year. And what you see in front of you is the flyer, the digital flyer that goes out into schools. So it, uh, this is for primary five to seven pupils. So that's um, sort of eight to ten year olds. Um, and they would, um, the teacher would sign up to a CLPL, so that's Career Long Professional Learning Session. Um, and as you can see, that's just passed um, recently. And so all around Scotland, there are teachers and their pupils taking part in our amazing year. And it gives you a little bit more information here on what that is. Um, what we wanted to do with our amazing year is um, we really wanted people to understand we can, that we can monitor air pollution to understand the impact of public health and the environment. And by using technology and working with nature, we have the power to improve air quality and reduce the effects of air pollution. And so we did a deep dive into all the research that I'm sure that you're involved in and thought like, how can we break this down for this age range? Um, and we thought about these three themes um, we broke it down into. So air on earth is all about what is air because it's a little bit of a tricky message I guess because you can't really 
see it. So um, what is it? What is it made of? Why is it so important? Um, and an activity that we've got around that, so it's all really practical activities. It's a sort of taste of how practical the science centre is, but in the classroom. So we really wanted to bring these activities alive um, through practicals. Um, and so this one is all about the, how important bogies are. Um, and so the, the, the children would make a bogey catcher, which is really like a paddle, like a ping pong paddle made out of cardboard, and double sided sticky tape, um, and try and catch bits of dust, which are some, some scrunched up bits of paper, um, with the bogey paddle, the bogey catcher. Um, and that's the idea is to go with a better understanding that uh, of the, the role of bogies um, and to stop. Um, Air pollution as breathing in. Um, so we think that's quite a memorable um, model in their minds of, of how that might work. And then we move on to air investigators. So the idea what is the impact of air pollution? How do we measure air pollution? And I'm sure you're involved in lots of ways that are much more sophisticated, but um, what we did in, in collaboration with talking to Paul and Graham from CIPA, who are on the call now. We um, thought about this idea of a sort of paper plate with Vaseline on it, and the children would then hang that up, they hang those up around their school in different areas, like outside, inside, near the boiler, near the road, um, and have a look after a few days and weeks as to how much um, air pollution, particulate matter, they might have um, accumulated, um, and then um, think about what that means. And then, but our future air, which is much more about how can we improve um, air quality in the future. I'll come on to talk about it in a minute. Um, so as you know, saying, these are the kind of learning resources that, that we would have and curriculum areas that we would cover. And these are just spells from the videos um, that we used to engage the pupils in the classroom. So the teachers would play these videos in the classroom. Again, air on air, air investigators, our future air. Um, we had the wonderful Fiona Maguire um, on one of our Meet the Expert calls. Um, so a call a little bit like this, except um, there were hundreds of school children from um, all over Scotland tuning in to hear what Fiona Maguire, environmental health officer, had to say about air pollution um, and her talk called Fresh Air for All. And we hope that um, Fiona or others would join us um, about the same time next year, so in a few months just to help us um, hear from an expert who works in the area. And that's really useful for the children, not just to hear about the cutting edge and um, cutting edge science that's happening, but also to hear from someone that's actually working in the field. And so people can think, oh, hang on, that could be my job um, when I grow up. And you can see there she was talking about the particular matter as well. And Colin might want to say more about this, um, but we highlighted this competition to the to the schools who take part in our amazing air, uh, which is an air quality banner competition. So pupils, as you can imagine, would throw out um, a poster, um, and then the the winning entries would get made into a banner that they can um, display outside your school. Feel free to jump in, Colin, if you want to say anything. About it. Um, and then we are making some, some edits, so we're, we're changing what um, we give out to the schools, and this is a prototype, so we thought a bit of a, a town planning, city planning activity would be quite good, so it will look better than this, this is sort of sketching it out, um, and we thought you might want to have a, a wee look at this, so um, you can see I think you get a, an idea from the left hand side of the, some sort of green space areas and some um, areas with factories. These would be all be little tiles, um, and then some would be roads, some would be um, cycle paths, um, and then the pupils would look at the tiles um, and then discuss how they could join them up to make their sort of ideal town or city. And then they'd have to think about, well, what would the air pollution be like in different areas of this town? And where would you like to live in this town, for instance? Um, and obviously we make it in a way that they could join them up in lots of different ways, not just one right answer. And um, so we're, we're getting our gamification heads on and thinking about how we can sort of <laughs> gamify that to make it a bit interesting. Um, and talking about something a little bit different that we've done um, again with SIPA is we created a touring exhibition. So 
this is about to come back to Glasgow Science Centre soon, and this is a picture of it in Glasgow Science Centre. Um, but it's also been to Aberdeen Science Centre, um, over to Leith near Edinburgh and to Dunblane. Um, it's seen about 20,000 people. Um, and you can see there, how can you help reduce traffic emissions? How is Scotland reducing traffic emissions? So it's all about um, air quality and thinking about how we can change your behaviour to um, increase air quality, improve air quality, I should say. And this is really just a little bit of um, feedback on learning labs. So um, since 2022, we've seen 3,700 pupils, I think. It's a lot of pupils. <laughs> and taking part in a, a lot of hours of, of learning. Um, and you can see in the top right, those pictures, uh, those are the paper plates in question, mm -hmm. and the pupils doing that practical activity there. Um, and just some nice quotes from uh, teachers and children and parents that take part. And we're really grateful um, to SEPA for our partnership because this enables us to deliver this learning programme to schools completely for free. So the um, last year and this year we've done the programme um, across two academic years so far and all the teachers, all the classes, schools that have taken part have engaged in all this learning for, for free and they're able to come and visit the Science Centre as well to support that. And we, we tend to, to deliver those visits around about clean air day so we can do um, promotion um, of that event as well, links to the learning that they've been doing in the classroom. Um, and we hope to kind of you know, carry on this relationship and, and be able to roll this learning programme out to many more schools um, and, and many more areas. Um, something that we're looking to do as a science centre is to work with other science centres across Scotland um, so that we're not just uh, limiting access to this to people that can that are close to us that can visit us, but we you know we may be able to to work with other science centres for them to roll it out with their local schools and to enable pupils to visit those science centres as well. So it's it's something that we're really grateful to have had the opportunity to work with CPO and that we hope we can carry on delivering for a long time into the future and keep evolving as the technology changes and as, as things change and improve going forward. Uh, hopefully we can continue to raise awareness um, and uh, roll this out wider. And that's us. We welcome your questions, which I think are in the chat. I'll stop sharing. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, there's yeah, clearly a lot of really good work going on there. It's uh, really nice to hear about it. Can I, I'll kick off the questions myself. I'll take that to, I'll abuse the privilege that's been granted to me. Um, I mean, your core audience is clearly the, uh, the Scottish schools. Do you engage with other parts of the UK as well? Or, or are there other uh, sort of groups doing similar uh, services in the other, uh, other parts of the UK? So there is no reason really that this couldn't go wider than, than Scottish schools. At the moment it is aligned with the Scottish curriculum, but that's very similar to, to that in other countries and there's no reason that this couldn't be extended. Um, there are many science and discovery centres and educational institutions across the UK doing similar things and we would love to work more closely with them. We are in a network of um, science and discovery centres, so we have good friends across many organisations across the UK. Um, I'm not sure we know exactly what's going on in terms of air quality across the rest of the UK, but we would absolutely welcome the opportunity to, to, to roll this out further and work with other organisations and institutions to, to weigh it out. Uh yeah, that's that's, uh, that's really really good news, I think. And I think yeah, through Tapas, uh, hopefully, um, um, uh, people can um, sort of come forward and uh, uh, sort of link up with you uh, rather better. So we'll, we'll make sure that uh, information on this is distributed more widely ac across the Tapas group than just the, the list of people that we have uh, um, present uh, today. Yeah, that'd be um, fantastic. Let's go to the uh, the questions. I'll take them in the order that they came up uh, with. Um, Caroline, 
uh, asked, what do you think of the big Scientific American um, reported review, 430 papers on what works best to get people to shift to more climate friendly behavior? Um, I don't know if you're aware of that, uh, that particular paper, um, but... Uh, I'm not that I'm writing it down. <laughs> ah, okay, okay. Um, Caroline, do you want to say a bit more about it? Um, I, I don't, please don't think that I'm against education. I love what you were just talking about, but I just, I just, I, I just was, at a, I'm, a, I'm in central London. And so I was at a city hall meeting about um, education and they were about um, air pollution and they were going, knowledge is power. And I'm like, I've got loads of knowledge and no power to sort out the dirty air around me. Mm -hmm. And then after I thought that, having changed my mind, because I've, I've said knowledge is power so many times in my life. And I thought, really? And then I got this scientific American stuff. So I put the reference in, I kind of summarized it in a, so I've got an air quality monitor on my, on my housing estate there. So I put a reference on it in the chat as to kind of summarize, summarizing it and with the, the event, Im, 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 immediate reference in there as well. And education was like, yeah, it's good to know about it, but it doesn't actually change people's behavior at all. And I just, and I'm not trying to down heart everything, but you know, like, you know, that's what I wanted to know about what you feel. Yeah, it's, it's a really it's a really interesting point and, and really valid. Um, our our work and our approach in the science centre is about um, not not directly trying to change people's behaviour, but um, using science and engagement with science to sort of activate that interest and that passion and that understanding of relevance, like this is relevant to me, and to encourage people to, um, to build their own narrative and, and realise for themselves. So by, by learning about this stuff and by engaging with this, like I am building my own picture that this isn't good and that there's something I can do about it. And so, yeah, that I, it's it's a, it's a really challenging one because because I think we all want to change people's behaviour, but see our approach is more through if we can really excite and inspire people to become interested and passionate and see the relevance of this in their lives, that we can only hope that they will go on to change their behaviour. And um, I don't know if you've got any. Oh, no, teaching kids is we've really got enough time to change stuff, you know, like because we're all. We, I mean, in central London, we're all just, I mean, I'm all of central London is illegal, even though even what Sadiq Khan's done is really good. And he's trying his best and, and it has improved, but we've still got all of this massive problem. And I, and I think it's not about individual behaviour. And you spoke about the Scottish government at some point, but I mean, like, it's not just about us trying to do our bit. It's about politicians doing their job. Yeah, I think it's really, I think it is. One of the challenges that we have is lots of lots of small interventions happening all over the place and not necessarily coming together. And I think what we are trying to do going forward is to bring all the people that are trying to do the same thing together in the same place and, and make one great big impactful intervention as opposed to lots of small scale ones. And, and I hope that that is a way that you can you can drive this sort of change. That's I mean, that's that's one approach that that we are trying to to go for. Thank you. I, just a personal view on that. I think one of the problems with encouraging behavioural change is that governments tend to have seen the solutions uh, to pollution problems in terms of um, fitting big bits of kits, power stations, and passing legislation on um, uh, so the quality of cars, etc. They don't really know how to deal with the behavioral end of things. So, uh, but I think that's beginning to change because we've got so far with um, the uh, the sort of the tech solutions, and uh, it's now it's it's now sort of being realised that well, you need to go further, and the way to do that is to um, uh, get into the behavioral stuff. So I'm I'm seeing it coming up more. It's not got very far yet, but I'm seeing it come up more. I honestly am. <laughs> um, let's go over to uh, Sarah now, uh, Sarah West. Um, um, Sarah said, uh, thank you for your honour and Susan. These sound such engaging ways for young people to get an understanding of air quality. Is there scope for promoting SAMI to schools? Um, and uh, I think Kat had given uh, a link above to the uh, SAMI project if they want to do more ongoing monitoring. 
all free. Can I ask Sarah, do you want to say a bit more about the SAMI project? Yeah, just very briefly, just because I know that somebody on this call told me, she was like, oh, Sammy's all over my Twitter feed. So um, like, I don't want to go on about it. Um, but just so we, we launched this week, we're trying to recruit 1500 schools across the UK, um, primary and secondary schools. Um, and um, they get a, a monitor that monitors PM10, uh, so PM10, total volatile organic compounds, CO2, um, temperature and relative humidity. And the idea is, is that they put this in their classroom and they, uh, they basically, it starts sending data to the researchers. So it's being led by Cambridge, Imperial, um, and then there's various other universities, including the University of York involved. Um, and the idea is, is that we get the data um, so we get a better understanding of air quality across these classrooms. But really importantly, the students and their teachers get an understanding of air quality in their classrooms and therefore what they can be done about it. So, for example, I see a, a spike in total volatile organic compounds every Monday at four o'clock. What happens every Monday at four o'clock? The cleaner comes in, for example. So what can we do? Maybe we can open the windows or use some different products or whatever it might be. Um, so, um, yes, yeah, so I just wondered if it's possible possible to um, have some sort of conversation which and we probably take this offline but some something which goes hey like you've been involved in this we've kind of enthused you um, if your school wants to get more involved like there is this project going on so the project's um, currently got funding until the end of August 2024 um, and hoping for funding beyond that but not sure what that looks like yet but there's a web app where they can go and they can see all of their results and do experiments um, and it prompts them to do activities to explore things like what happens if we all jump up and down well the CO2 goes up um, and what happens when you open a window well depending on where you are that either increases your pollution or it decreases your um, particulate matter depending on where in the country you are etc so yeah that's all. That's really interesting. Thanks for the information on it. I mean, I, I don't see any any issue or, or challenges. Obviously, we'll, we'll chat to Colin and, and Graham about it as well, but I, I don't see any issue with signposting schools or um, giving, passing the information on. I should say that they've engaged in the programme um, would they like to take it further and be involved in this project? I, I think that would be a really, really nice link. That would be fabulous. So we have someone from the... Um, I can't remember what the Science Centre's overall body is called, but we have someone from the Science Centre's overall body on our engagement panel. Um, so you might end up hearing about it from a different route as well. Um, but um, yeah, that would be amazing. Thank you. Yeah, is that from ASDC? That's our, yes. our network. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. OK, now uh, Amber has asked a couple of questions. The first is does every child in the school take part or is it more aimed at a focus group of students in the school? Uh, so let's stress that one first. Yeah, so it is eight to 10 year olds. So um, in Scotland that's primary five, six and seven. So the last three years in primary school. And in the whole class. Uh -huh, yeah, the whole class in that age range would, would take part, yes. Um, we do have other learning labs that are for more down the school and um, for er um, early years, etc. But this is the nature of it, I think, lends itself to that age range. The other thing we have found out with some of the learning labs, and it wasn't our intention, but that schools are using them for science clubs and things. So if they're doing lunchtime science clubs or after school, so typically teachers are, are doing it as part of the curriculum, the whole class takes part and it's within the school day. We found out that other schools are using the content applies basically to other um, scenarios like science clubs and after school clubs and things. Okay, and there was the second question from uh, Amber. How did you find engaging with schools? Were there certain things that made schools want to engage uh, with the project more than others? And if I can ask Amber to, um, is, is this reflecting Amber problems that you've been facing? Uh, or is this just a, a more general question? Um, yeah, so in my project, I'm currently trying to engage with schools to deliver a pack, which will be a couple of lessons for the whole school, ideally, and then going on to work with a focus group on more specific kind of air quality monitoring um, and kind of introducing my project to some schools 
some schools love it and are really engaged and say, yeah, we can fit this into lessons. And then I have some that go, oh, that's going to be hard to get in. The curriculum's tight, all of this. So it's just maybe it's just who I'm speaking to in the school, maybe, and how engaged with air quality they are. Um, but I yeah. just wondered if there were certain things. I guess the practical element is always something that teachers seem to like. I wondered if there was any other information you could share. Or oh, we can talk about this all day. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, so uh, some insight into that from our side would be uh, the curriculum makes a big, huge difference if you can demonstrate how this supports teachers to deliver what they need to deliver in the curriculum. That makes a massive difference for us. Um, another hook for us, we're very fortunate that we have this amazing visitor attraction that we can invite people to come and visit as part of the programme. So that makes a big, that's a big draw um, that pupils are um, able to come and visit for free, their transport subsidised. Um, it's a really great opportunity that they wouldn't necessarily otherwise have. So there are some hooks that, that help to kind of draw them in um, to that. But I think as well, we have... Um, we have really good relationships with local authorities. So if the schools are being encouraged to take part in these type of programmes from their education departments, that makes a big, big difference too. So we do find that schools in some local authorities engage more than others because they've got people at the top level in the education department that is saying, you should do this, it's really important that you take part in this thing. It's, yeah, that's kind of there. Yeah, I think that's the main point, is getting the person, the decision maker, who can then disseminate your message out yeah and, and you will always come across schools that resist that are struggling yeah. to fit it in that don't see it as relevant that are we we have that too and um, don't get me wrong that, that i think that's just that will happen and um, but yeah finding the right person with the right influences it makes a big difference and we've yeah we've tried to embed what we have and um, look to embed literacy and numeracy into these activities so that we can really highlight that to the teachers that this isn't like you'll do this in science hour you could do this in your literacy time or your numeracy time and mm -hmm. um, if that applies i think that is really teachers top priority um, in our experience anyway is literacy and numeracy um, and that meet the expert session i mean that comes back again and again has been really powerful um, and I mean, we do that over teams, so you don't need to do that in our physical space, although you could, you could do a site visit or something um, somewhere interesting, obviously there's logistics to think about, but some element of meeting an expert um, meeting an expert is a draw. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. So we'll go back to Sarah uh, now, who, whose second question is, how much signposting do you do to sources of support? pupils are concerned about air quality after your session, what sorts of things do you suggest they do? So we have background information that we share with the teacher, um, and so there are links to further sort of information for them. Um, and we do really expect that the teacher would then pick that up with the pupils. We don't get a lot of sort of um, further questions from, from pupils or teachers, but we could, if anyone's got, and I'm sure on this call, we would have lots of, of scope for, if there's links that we should be um, highlighting to teachers, then we absolutely can. And I suppose as well, through the partnership with SEPA and SEPA's logo appearing and SEPA kind of staff appearing through the expert, uh, I think that, that raising awareness within schools of, of SEPA and what SEPA does, makes a difference too and that would, that would be a point of contact for schools to go to if, if anyone was looking to uh, have ask questions or further their um, interest. I mean we do talk about clean air day that's probably getting a bit away from the question that you're asking but um, we do celebrate clean air day um, which is in June, June. I can't remember exactly when it is but I'm sure you know um, and we do other kind of columns around that but I don't know if that's answering your question yet. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned Clean Air Day because that uh, seamlessly links with uh, the various comments that Colin has been putting in the chat, uh, one of which is um, uh, uh, kids using uh, Clean Air Day uh, or, or Clean Air Day being used as a media uh, platform. Uh, another of the issues Colin raised in the chat was um, 
uh, banners out school, uh, outside schools, letting children use artwork to help promote better air quality. And those banners have been used in schools across Scotland and have been used as uh, local authority wide competitions. And third point Colin raised was Angus School uh, Council have used the air quality sensors to help drive road closure around schools that work with the schools through practical learning such as this and others promoted by SEPA. Um, Colin, do you want to say any more uh, regarding the, uh, the these issues or anything else that comes into your mind right now? Uh, <clears throat> No, I'm okay. I mean, I've, I've just put something else up, um, talking about meeting the expert. I think, as uh, Fiona and that have said, it, it really was, it, it's a really good way of, of uh, promoting the issues within the classrooms. Um, it's time consuming, but we've always had good feedback uh, whenever we've went out to schools or whenever we've had others going out to schools. Um, but keep it, keep the message simple. That's one thing I would always say. Yeah, thanks for that. Let's go back. Uh, I take yes, Car Caroline's comment that surely it should be called "Not Yet Clean Air Day." Uh, yeah, I think we can we can take that. Um, it remind that reminds me of a 1970s anti-pollution slogan, uh, which went, um, "I shot an arrow in the air and it stuck." But uh, we will we'll go back up the list of uh, questions. Uh, Amy said one of the quotes from a parent mentioned that the project had sparked family discussions. Have you heard any anecdotal evidence of the impact that children participating in this had on the adults that they live with? It's a really good one. Um, Evaluation is actually quite a tricky thing with these projects. Um, we try really hard to get feedback from teachers and pupils um, and it, it, that's, that is a one of the challenges, I'd say one of the biggest challenges with, with doing a project like that. Um, we hear lots of nice things when the children are in the science centre, saying what they recall from the programme. Um, they know, you know, we hear things like, you know, you should turn your car engine off and you should walk to school and not drive. So we hear lots of nice, as you say, more kind of anecdotal things. Um, and I I'd say probably not directly about the impact it's had on the family, but I suspect that they are talking about it with the families because if they're talking about it when they come into the science centre and they're you know doing artwork and they're doing home learning, um, that that the the children are really good with this kind of stuff in an experience that it, it, it kind of um, they remember it and it's relevant to them and they they're quite good at telling their parents what they should and shouldn't do. Um, so I do. We, we believe, we imagine that it's happening. We have reason to, to think that it is happening, but, but nothing really more concrete than that, unfortunately. Okay, we'll go on to Heather's question. Uh, next, all the activities you've outlined sound great. Thanks for sharing. Adding to the individual behavior systematic changes debate, have you ever tried undertaking these interactive activities with policymakers? No, the short answer is no. Um, I guess it comes, it's, a, it's an interesting point and I suspect there would be some impact there. Um, I suppose it comes back to the science centre's role in this and whereas we think of ourselves as an um, educational charity that is trying to engage people with science, I, I'd say we're not, um, we're, we're not kind of prioritising uh, changes in policy or um, I suppose we're supporting other, so we'd be supporting CEPA with that and supporting other organizations. Yeah, we're not building, we're not yeah. building, that's a good, that's a, but yeah, no, I think it's a, it's a really interesting point and really valid. I think it's a, it would be a, a really interesting approach, um, but certainly it's, it's not um, our priority to be doing that directly. Okay, thanks for that. Um, Heather, did you want to add anything uh, to that? Uh, no, not really. Um, just, uh, I, I just think it would be very interesting to see <laughs> how the policymakers might react to, to taking part in such activities. Um, and, uh, you know, I suppose if, if there are ever any events that you hold, which is kind of open to 
wider selection of people coming to visit the Glasgow Science Centre, then um, maybe it's something you could think about for the future. And yeah, I, I totally get your point about not um, kind of what your role is and everything. Um, but yeah, I just uh, having from my research experience, um, I think it could be quite interesting to, to actually get those sorts of people doing these activities, even alongside the, the children and seeing um, how they uh, how they experience it and if it if it gets them engaged around air quality as well. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, that's an interesting idea, thanks. I, I can come in with a, an example of that um, and I put it on the chat. Uh, we had a, a session with um, kids across Edinburgh and it was leading up to Clean Air Day. Um, and because of CEPA's position uh, within Scotland and uh, its closeness with the Scottish Government, we managed to get a minister along to one of the schools uh, who was participating in um, not just these kind of activities with the school kids, but also a question and answer session uh, with the school kids, which kind of turned into more of placards than anything else. But um, it got the message across, um, which was quite good. So, yeah, we have managed it. Um, occasionally, shall we say. Yeah, I'm, I'm wondering if there's a space there for people with working with different audiences of so, you know, people working with schools uh, on, on, on communication, people working with um, uh, sort of policy makers at, at, uh, at, at different levels. You know, be it uh, you know, local government or national government or, or whatever. Whether it'd be worth uh, getting together at some point to compare notes and uh, see what works for um, works for their own audiences, and whether that uh, can be um, uh, applied to the other audience as well. So I think it's an interesting question. Um, now I think I'm out of questions. There's a few more comments in the uh, in in the chat. I think I'm out of questions there. If I've missed anybody, please put up your hand now, and um, then ask your question, or if you've got further questions to ask at this point, then put up your hand. I'm not seeing any hands uh, going up. Um, so I'd like to uh, thank our speakers again. Um, I've been really impressed by the uh, work that you're doing and looking at the level of engagement that uh, we've had uh, in the chat and through the discussion. I think everybody else has found it uh, uh, really useful uh, too. So, um, yeah, please keep in touch with Tapas, and um, it's uh, it's it's good to have you on board. Um, well, thank you so much for having us. It's been really enjoyable for us too. Thank you. And Sarah, I'm sure we'll talk more about monitors. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, that just leaves me, I think, to announce our next seminar. Uh, which is in two weeks' time. There's not one next week. There is one two weeks' time um, uh, at, the, uh, at, at the same time. That will be um, by uh, Run Ming Yao at the University of Reading. Kat, what's Run Ming's title? Has she given you a title yet? She has. It's Prioritising Actions for Improving School Classroom Air Quality. Right, thanks for that. So Prioritising Actions... Uh, for improving um, uh, school classroom air quality. That will be the next um, session in two weeks' time. Um, and uh, with that, I will um, uh, thank you all for attending and um, look forward to seeing you at the next, uh, next of the seminars. So thanks a lot, everybody. <laughs>